So tell us a little bit about where Master Limited Partnerships are now. I think the other thing I'd highlight is just the explosive growth that we've seen, and this growth is being driven by, I guess, really two things. I guess five or ten years ago, most of the growth that MLPs were experiencing was largely a function of acquisitions, dropping assets from C-Corps down into MLPs. But what we've seen over the last five years is a very strong and likely sustainable organic growth story. Oil production is growing, as Rob mentioned, natural gas, natural gas liquids. And as that production continues to grow, and it's growing high single digit uh, percentage points uh, currently and likely will going forward, you simply have to have infrastructure to facilitate moving those growing production volumes from the wellhead to the end user. And it's the MLP companies that all three of us are investing in that are at the forefront of building out all that infrastructure. The energy boom that's going on. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's the, the revolution is right. talked about constantly in North Dakota. It's kind of this boom frontier. Uh, but there, there's also some seem, seemingly cracks in that. There's some reports of production coming down or, or growth not increasing to the degree that it has been. T tell us about that, about the, the current state of energy production and exploration. And are, are we reaching kind of a plateau in all these new kind of energy uh, sources that are coming up? I'm going to argue no. Okay. And we'll see what uh, the other two say. Um, there have been plenty of articles. I, I seemingly get an email, I don't know, once a month with some articles saying that uh, shale is a fraud, that uh, energy production is about to roll over. Uh, the reality is, is that while these wells have high decline rates, that's true, a lot of these wells decline in terms of production in about 80% in the first year. But after that, it's a fairly flat plateau that lasts a long time thereafter. And as the percentage of wells that are older instead of new increases, which by definition, as we drill more and more wells, is going to be true, uh, offsetting uh, natural production declines is not an insurmountable task. And I think you need to look no further than the reality that the rig count in the United States, the number of rigs drilling for oil and for natural gas, has been effectively flat for the last couple of years. Yet uh, oil and natural gas production and natural gas liquids production uh, continues to clip along at an 8, 9, 10 percent growth rate, and that's likely, in my opinion, going to continue going forward. Of course, one of, the, one of the biggest developments recently has been the Kinder Morgan event. So tell us what happened and why it's important and what the meaning of it will be going forward. It was a, a very large transaction. It was actually the largest energy transaction that we've seen since uh, Exxon merged with Mobil. Uh, I think the timing of it perhaps caught the market a little off guard. Perhaps the magnitude of it caught us off guard, but the fact that Kinder did something, I don't think surprised any of the three of us. I mean, Kinder was in a position where they needed to make a transaction, and the key issue was because and of the... And tell us again what actually happened. Well, I'm sorry, a good point. Uh, Kinder Morgan is four publicly traded entities. You have a general partner, which is KMI, and then you have three MLP companies, which was KMP, KMR, and EPB. And basically, KMI is absorbing all the master limited partnerships, EPB, KMP, KMR, and everything will now be domiciled at the KMI entity, which is not a partnership. It's actually a corporation. Um, and Kinder did this because their cost of equity financing, as a function of how much cash they had to pay to their general partner, the way these partnership agreements are set up, had become onerous. I mean, their cost of equity capital was in excess of 12 percent. And you look at the overall space, most people have a uh, cost of equity capital between 5 and 6 percent. And it left them at a competitive disadvantage for, for two things. One, acquisitions, obviously. But two, it left them at a uh, disadvantage in terms of returns on their, uh, their own internal growth uh, opportunity set. I think most of us, and I certainly did, expected that the MLPs would buy the general partner, actually the inverse of what the tra transaction was that was announced. Uh, but the fact that they made a transaction, I don't think was a surprise. I was immediately asked, I'm sure all three of us were immediately asked right after the deal, does this mean that MLPs are dead? Because we have this huge transaction that effectively absorbs three MLPs and puts them in a corporation. Uh, I would argue this is a one-off. This was specific to Kinder Morgan. This was not an offensive move at first. It was a defensive move to fix their cost of equity capital. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to see at some point down the road uh, some assets in the Kinder fam family ultimately migrate their way back towards an MLP over time. And then how big a piece of each of your funds was, was this? Uh, how I run uh, five different strategies and it was anywhere between 8 and 14 percent across the entire Kinder complex. So it was a, it was a meaningful event for us. W was there any feeling among, I've, have you gotten any response from adv advisors and um, I guess indirectly from shareholders saying, you know, maybe we should steer clear of this now because who knows what's going to happen and I want to get stuck with a tax bill. I mean, like, how does... I've gotten those calls. I've had a couple of advisors reach out to me, and uh, they're not happy about the tax bill. But uh, as I remind them, they've had a, a you know a big step up in their um, in the price of the stock. Uh, you're now left with an entity that is fixed from a cost of capital perspective. We're now poised for growth again. 
Uh, and if you look at expectations, or at least my expectations for distribution growth or uh, dividend growth from the succeeding KMI, it's going to be greater than it was for KMP. So yes, you may face a tax bill, but you also had a stock that gapped up enormously on, on, the, on the heels of the announcement. And with a little bit of patience and a little bit uh, longer term viewpoint instead of a shorter term viewpoint, I think those shareholders are going to be just fine. Okay, so this is kind of a hiccup in the MLP world. Where are the, where are the long-term long opportunities in other areas? What do you see as... Other, in, in other areas? Well, in, 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 in LPs in general, you know, sort of aside from Kinder Morgan and what will happen going forward. But. Well, my view, it sounds like John and I maybe have a slightly different view of it, okay. is, uh, I mean, the growth is being driven by production. And so long as production continues to grow, we're going to have to have more infrastructure. It's just, it, to me, it's that simple. And obviously, it matters where your infrastructure is, what basins you're exposed to, uh, how your balance sheet looks, what your cost of capital is. But when you factor all those things together as a sector, putting individual stocks aside for the moment, uh, I still think we're poised for sustainable growth. I don't think this is a one or two year story. Uh, I've said many times, I think it's going to be a multi-decade growth story uh, as we continue to see U.S. production grow and uh, with it, the infrastructure that's needed. And how much, give an estimate, how much infrastructure is needed? Like how much are we talking about? Well, I mean, just look at what we're doing right now. I mean, this year we'll probably build out close to $40 billion of infrastructure in the United States. If we'd had this conversation back in 2011, it was around $10 billion. So we've had a fourfold increase in the amount of infrastructure spending in three very short years. And my view is that we're going to need to continue building out, you know, roughly $40, $50 billion of infrastructure on an annual basis going forward. I mean, just look at the number of publicly traded MLPs. I mean, back in 2010, when we launched our first fund, there were 70. Today, there's around 120, and we're probably going to continue to see 10 to 20 IPOs a year. Uh, that's only going to increase trading liquidity, only increase investment options for us as portfolio managers. It just makes our life a, a lot easier. So what in the midstream do you find interesting or attractive, and what do you stay away from? Well, I mean, at ClearBridge, uh, we think the biggest benefit of the asset class as a whole, MLPs broadly, are stable and predictable uh, cash flows. Assets that are backed up by long-term contracts, government-regulated returns, very stable and predictable cash flows literally for years, sometimes 10, 15, 20, 30-year contracts backing up these assets. The minute you introduce assets that have cash flow volatility, whether, as John mentioned, E&P companies or uh, refining assets, fertilizer plants, whatever the case may be, uh, to me, that uh, limits, if not eliminates, the, uh, the biggest benef benefit of the asset class, which is stable and predictable cash flows. So we, like John, uh, stay away from E&P. We stay away from anything that would uh, loosely be, de be described as a variable payout uh, rate uh, MLP. And we kind of stick to boring assets, to be honest with you. These are pipelines. These are storage uh, tanks. These are terminal assets. And while they may be boring, they're not much fun to go look at. Uh, they generate an enormous amount of cash flow with an enormous amount of predictability, and that allows us to deliver to our investors what we put forth to them that we would give them, which is a relatively high level of, level of income and then growth on top of that in time. So when, they, when, when a pipeline company decides to when they decide to build a pipeline from point X to point Y, yes. do they start out with a contract to say, we're not going to build it unless we get you know, a commitment from somebody to yes. say, okay, we're going to ship this much stuff through it? I mean, to get, get a, and these are multi-billion dollar projects right. very often, and to, and to get that sort of a project financed, you have to have uh, commitments uh, to get that kind of a, a project financed, if not permitted, from the governments. So let's talk about, while there's inherent demand, apparently, for these facilities over the, over the near term and medium term, even the long term, given the country's voracious energy needs, what are the risks? What are the risks of, for example, changes in the tax code, A, or B, um, cha changes in, in, interest rate, in interest rates going up? How would that affect things? So let's, let's take any, anyone you want to start with. Let's say changes in the tax code, making... Uh, mass limited partnership less favorable for individual investors? Um, I mean, I, I will argue that it's unlikely uh, that we have any sort of near -medium, ter medium term change in the overall structure. And I think the reasons for that are rather simple. Um, I mean, this is the number one job creating sector in the entire U.S. economy. The government has had a mantra of trying to reduce the amount of imported oil since the Arab embargoes back in the 70s. We're actually doing that now. And then the other thing to consider is what would happen for the government if we actually eliminated the structure and all these things are tra taxed like C-Corps? it's not that big of a revenue generator for the government. I mean, the last study I saw estimated there would be about $3 billion a year of incremental tax revenue to the U.S. government. That in the context of a five or $600 billion a year deficit doesn't do much, much to fix our fiscal was. So while it's not likely, it is possible. Um, but I do agree with John that, that you know, having 100% of your eggs in MLPs is probably not the right way to go. 
whether you're an individual investor, whether you're a, a large institutional investor either. And of course, given the chaos in the Middle East and with Russia and Ukraine, it seems like having domestic production is probably a good idea. So. Absolutely. Uh, but let me get back to the point you were making, Chris, about mm -hmm. eggs in a basket. Uh, even though you're uh, experts in MLPs and not necessarily what advisors do in terms of setting up portfolios for individuals, what kind of advice might you give to an advisor as to how much, you know, what is the right amount of MLPs to have in an individual's portfolio and for what reason? Like, why should they have MLPs and to what degree, aside from the fact that, you know, you'd love to sell more MLPs, but what, what's the right amount? I think the reasons are, are clear. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a yield starved world. We are offering investors securities that have uh, a, a relatively high level of uh, income. There's tax advantages to it. And most importantly, there's growth to that. I mean, those are the big selling points for MLPs. I personally think it gets dangerous when you start generalizing on how much exposure an investor should have to MLPs, because obviously that's going to depend greatly on every uh, investor's um, age, income levels, uh, desires, risk tolerances, et cetera. So I'm going to shy away from that. Uh, but the underlying reasons why you would want to own some, irrespective of how much, I think are very clear. I think actually that's a great segue into the interest rate question. Right. You know, so how do these things behave in different interest rate environments? Uh, MLPs are inversely correlated to 10-year treasuries. That's true over a five-year, 10-year, whatever window you want to look at. And the reasons for that are very simple. I mean, as Rob mentioned, they're not fixed income securities. They increase their payouts to investors year in, year out, without exception. Even during the financial crisis, we saw MLPs, albeit modestly, increase their uh, distributions uh, to investors. So these are assets that have not historically, and I'm going to argue should not, looking forward, trade with the overall interest cycle over time. Now, can that happen on a, on a one-day basis, on a one-week basis, or even one-month basis? Can they trade with interest rates? Certainly they can. But if you look over longer periods of time, uh, they have not traded like bonds, and there's a reason for that, which is why they offer investors a high level of portfolio diversification. And just to throw some stats out there to kind of make my point, I mean, 10-year treasuries bottomed in July of 2012, 1.38%, I think, was the bottom. We actually uh, ended 2013 at more than 3%, just a little bit above 3%. Um, if you are wary of rising interest rates, you would have thought that MLPs would have gotten crushed in that kind of environment. And in fact, they were actually up 22%. Other income-oriented uh, securities like REITs were up, uh, I think, 7%. Utilities were up 5%, and bonds were down 2%, looking at the Barclay DAG. So, I mean, again, I think it depends on what your time horizon is. Uh, if it's a short-term discussion, maybe there's more validity to arguing that interest rates are going to directly influence MLPs. But over time, uh, I, I don't think that's going to hold true. And it gets back to that growth and income part of the story that I think is so vital to why investors should own these stocks. Were many of the companies able to refinance at lower rates when the interest rates were really very low? Tremendous amount of uh, refinancing that was done. Mainly, it was, actually wasn't refinancing. It was actually paying off revolvers and terming out their debt long term. So aside from interest rates, uh, what other risks? I mean, there aren't. There doesn't seem to be that much of a risk of rising interest rates. Where are there potential risks for MLP investors? What should they be watching for? While we're certainly seeing more cyclical assets come into the asset class, the contracting structures have changed over the last five to ten years as well. You know, most contracts that we're seeing right now are fixed fee, uh, cost of service, whatever the case may be, versus maybe five or ten years ago, uh, these management teams might have been willing to take on more of the commodity or more of the volume risk uh, than investors such as all three of us are willing to take on today. We're reaching the top of the hour, so I'd like to get, go around and get some takeaways. What should advisors and their clients come away with from our session on mass limited partnerships? What should they know? and what should they come away thinking about? If you have a downdraft in, in these stocks, and they're stocks, I mean, there's going to be volatility, investors need to step back and ask, what's changed? If the underlying thesis for why you own these assets and the underlying cash flow generation of the assets is not changed, that volatility needs to be exploited. Now, if something changes dramatically, whether it's tax code or fundamentals of the underlying market that we're all investing in, that's a different story. But the volatility that we've seen in the past and that we'll very likely see going forward more often than not, so long as the fundamental thesis is intact, should be something to exploit, to buy into, rather than panicking and selling it just because the stocks have moved down. And they, they move down typically now for, for I guess, for what reason? Is well, you can look at what's just happened over the last couple of weeks. I mean, uh, rates have gone up a little bit and stocks have gone down. They've made a very nice move. They'd substantially outperformed the broader market. They pulled in, what, 5 or 6%. I mean, it was, it was hardly a horrific correction, but it was a little bit of a correction. Uh, and certainly, my, when that happens, my phone lights up. 
and people are getting jittery, what's going on, am I missing something? And again, step back, look at the fundamentals, try to disengage yourself from the emotions and understand what it is you're investing in and understand that these are long-lived assets. Uh, my personal view is that MLPs are not really appropriate from a trading strategy perspective, given the longevity of the assets that we're investing in. So when I analyze a company, you know, I'm looking not one quarter down the road, not half a year down the road, but literally multiple years down the road, given the kinds of assets that we're all investing in.